Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 161, which reads as follows. Atanahi katang papang atajang atasambhavang abhi abhimathati dumedhang vajirang va smamayang maning which means by oneself is evil done evil has self is born of self atajja is born of self atasambhava is uh, arises comes into being because of self because of oneself abhimat Tati dumedhang, the one with poor wisdom, a fool, crushes themselves. Vajirang vasmamayang maning, just like a dime, just as a diamond crushes a jewel made of another rock, a different kind of jewel. So evil comes from the self. No one can bring evil to you. There's no such thing as the evil eye. Evil, both the cause and the effect, meaning all the real evil states inside of us, and also the evil of, of suffering, and the bad stuff that comes loss and blame and pain all of these all of the bad things all sorts of sufferings they come from the self this is buddhist theory buddha the claim that we make in buddhism so what does what does the story what is this story about this verse was told apparently in relation to a, an upasaka, a layman, named Mahakala, who it says was a sotapanna, which means he had practiced quite well and, and seen Nibbana. He was a special person, enlightened, in, you know, on the first stage of enlightenment. Only as a lay person, not, it wasn't even a monk. And uh, he was, as a sotapanna, he was quite diligent in his practice of Buddhism. And on the, on the eighth day and the fifteenth day, that means when the moon is full or empty and, and halfway through, so they would count in India fifteen days or sometimes fourteen days between the empty moon or the new moon and the full moon. And then they had a special day in India on the eighth day. So the Every 15 or 14 days it goes full and then empty, but halfway through on the eighth day they also had a special day. So but in Buddhism they took this up as well. And even in, in Thailand today they keep, people who are religious in Thailand will um, keep the eighth day and then the 15th or the 14th day, depending. And they'll take up the eight precepts and they'll stay in the monastery listening to the Dhamma, so that's what he did. We have this practice still in places in Thailand, and here you have it, this ancient record that this is how they used to do it as well. And during the night, when he was staying at the monastery, listening to the Dhamma, listening to the monks teach, some thieves broke into a house, some house in the city. This was taught when the Buddha was near Jetavana, so someone in in Sawati, thieves broke into somebody's house. Uh, there's this, there was a story of uh, how, thieves, how everyone went to the monastery, and the thieves knew this, and they would go and steal from people who had gone to the monastery. This kind of thing happens in modern times as well. There's stories, of, stories even of people who would go and sit in meditation at the monasteries, big monasteries, 
and they put their purse beside them and they'd, they'd open their eyes later and their purse was gone. It makes people wonder, hey, is this really good for me, this meditation? I thought it was supposed to be good karma, right? And we're talking about evil coming to you. Well, if evil comes because of things you do, does that mean because I'm meditating, evil comes to me when I close my eyes? These kind of questions are questions that Buddhists sometimes ask. Uh, but in this case, the, own, the owners were in the house. They weren't Buddhists, perhaps, or they weren't diligent. They weren't at the monastery, but they were, and so they were awakened by the noise. And they jumped up out of bed and they grabbed their weapons, swords or bows and arrows or whatever they had back then and took after the thieves. And when the thieves found out, the, realized that they were found out, they began to throw things away and they ran away. But the owners kept running after it. And so they ran and ran and they ran all the way to the forest, the, the Jeta forest. And they saw that they saw the people pursuing them and they ran, ran all the way to Jeta on that where the Buddha was staying. So early in the morning, Mahakala, this layman who was, he was, uh, he, he had listened to the Dhamma all night and he was uh, bathing himself. And if you go to Jetavana now, you can still see where they say the pool once was. There was a monastery pool. Now it's kind of a muddy area with, uh, well, there's water there with lotuses and so on but they probably planted the lotuses later. And so one thief, one of the thieves was carrying a bunch of the goods and he came upon the Mahakala at the, at the pool and when he saw him, he figured it was, uh, he, he had to ditch this, so he threw it and he threw it right where Mahakala was bathing and ran off into the forest. And the pursuers, they were right, right behind this thief. And when they came crashing through the forest and they saw this bag of valuables uh, at the feet of Mahakala, who was uh, standing, just come, come out of the bathing, uh, out of the pool, or, or however, they said, "There's the thief! Grab him!" And they grabbed him and they beat him. And in fact, they beat him to death. That's it. They seized him, they beat him to death. Well, they said, hey, hey, you're the one, so you're the one who broke into our house, yet here you are pretending to have just stayed in the monastery all night, listening to the Dhamma. What a, what a fraud. And they grabbed him and beat him to death, and having thrown his dead body aside, they departed. Imagine, no? here we have the rewards of listening to the Dhamma all night. He did what most people never even think about doing. He dedicated his whole day and night to Buddhism, to the Dhamma. And this was his reward. And the, the monks woke up in the morning as the sun was coming up and they went to bathe. Or they went out to the pool to get with their water pots and they saw his body. And they saw this body there, they went and reported it to the teacher, to the Buddha. And they say, look, this man is, is, this is quite a strange occurrence. Here he was, we talk about the Dhamma protecting well. Here he was so immersed in the Dhamma and then he passed, he was, he was brutally murdered in cold blood. Uh, well, maybe not cold blood, yeah, cold blood, I guess, but people thought they were... I don't even know what cold blood means. I guess it means without any remorse, which is true. People had no remorse. They were quite happy to kill this man. But they thought they were doing, to some extent, uh, the right thing. You can tell these people were not Buddhists. That's why they were in their monastery, in their homes. 
if they had been Buddhist, they wouldn't have been there, and the, monk, the people would have taken away all their belongings, and they would have gone home and said, "Oh, good, now, now we're free from all from the worry and concern of all those things." But since they were not Buddhist, they were at home, and they ended up becoming murderers, which really is the worst of the two. If you consider the difference between a thief and a murderer, these guys got the short end of the stick. But anyway, the monks and novices were kind of concerned. They said, well, Mahakala didn't deserve that. What the heck? And the Buddha said, oh, well, it's quite true that his death was undeserved if you only consider the present condition, present state of affairs. They say, listen to that. One considers only the present state. Right? And this is important because this is how we often consider things. We look around and we say, I'm doing good things. I'm practicing meditation. Why am I suffering still? It's, I mean, it's quite a simple concern to answer is that you know, the universe is a heck of a lot more complex than just what's going on here and now. Our brain is, of course, our brain alone, one brain, is far more complex than simply do good, get good. But nonetheless, the Buddha has an answer. And he says, yes, there's extenuating circumstances. What he received was an exact conformity with an evil deed he committed in a previous state of existence. So apparently this is a thing where there are one-to-one -one, uh, corollaries where you did something and it, you experience very similar results in a later life. I don't think it's always like that, but it appears to be a pattern. And it must have very much to do with the imprint of the first deed. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just stick with the story. So a long time ago, long long time ago from the long time ago when this verse was actually taught, a long time ago before that, there was a certain outlying village and a nearby forest. And the, the, the path through from the village went through the forest. Uh, and this forest was dangerous. There were bandits living in this forest, kind of, I guess, like Robin Hood in a sense. Though perhaps, uh, I mean, I don't know what the circumstances were, but there anyway, th there were thieves in the forest. The story of Robin Hood is interesting. Mm. Questioning the morals, the white and the black karma involved with that. Here we have a sort of a Robin Hood. And uh, so the king sent a soldier, one of his, his officers, to go and be stationed at this village and to escort people through the forest. So the soldiers would provide an escort, keep people safe, and there would be sort of a, a, a payment given. And this worked quite well for some time. You know, the, the soldiers would escort people through the forest for, for money. And it was income for the king, I guess, and for the soldiers. Uh, until one day, a certain man, accompanied by a very beautiful wife, uh, wanted to pass through the forest. And the soldier, upon seeing this beautiful woman in the carriage, became instantly enamored with her and decided he must have her. And so he sent them back. He said, oh, no, it's too late in the day. We can't pass through the forest today, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in the morning. And here he is, con you know, scheming up some nefarious purpose uh, that he needs time for. And so he says, oh no, we're doing and the, the man says, oh come now, it's, it's not late, we, we can go. And so he says, no, no, and he orders his men to turn them back around. And he says, look, you can stay in my house tonight. I will, I will host you myself. And so the, reluctantly the couple agrees and they stay in his house and during the night he, he takes a precious gem, a very, very, uh, a diamond I guess. And he, he has his men put it in the carriage of this, this 
traveling merchant. And in the morning he sounds the alarm and uh, has all the, all, everyone searched. And his men go and search everyone and they search this man's carriage and they find this diamond and they beat the man up and they bring him to the head, they bring him to the village headmaster and the village headmaster scold, you know, uh, shakes his head and says, yeah, you, you after, after you were shown such kindness by this soldier, how you, this is how you repay it. And so he had him beaten to death as well. So the Mahakala, I guess, was the soldier. It doesn't actually say, and it probably says in the Jataka, but it's kind of questionable. Was Well, the headmaster was the one who beat him to death, or had him beaten to death, the village, uh, village chief. But much more likely that it was the soldier. Mahakala at one time was the soldier who managed to have a, an innocent man beaten to death. And it says, as a result of his evil deed, as a result of this nefarious deed, he was born in hell, avici hell, for a long period of time. And the thing about hell is that it's not over when it's over. Once you get out of hell and you come back to the human realms or the animal realms, you suffer more there. There's, there's, there's the residual effects. It's a gradual process of... Uh, Recovery. Heaven and hell are like that. It's not like it's not like you go to heaven and and then you come back and heaven's gone. It's much more like up and then you, know, you come back to earth. You're probably born in in the human realms as as uh, someone very rich, beautiful, that kind of thing. But the thing about good, the thing about Evil is that they don't they, they don't make you necessarily good people. The reason why it takes so long in hell is because um, it takes a long time to realize the 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 bad the evil of what you've done. So um, when we talk about people going to heaven and we talk about people who are in a good state, human beings who are rich, who are beautiful, these kind of things, and you, you see often how they can be real terrible people. On the other hand, you see people suffering like Mahakala or people who are in great states of torment in various ways, and you think, well, they're such nice people. And you wonder how that could be. It actually, there is actually a relationship. So uh, the problem with and this is something that meditators should keep should listen carefully to. Is the problem with pleasure, ease, comfort, is that it makes you lazy, obviously. If you're not pure, if you're not mindful, comfort can be your worst enemy because it indulges your desires, your aversions. It doesn't challenge them. It doesn't uh, test them. It doesn't show you your weaknesses doesn't show you your bad habits, it encourages them. And so heaven is not something that makes you a better person, right? And so if a person spends a lot of time in heaven, it's quite possible that by the end of it they're just a wretched individual full of all sorts of biases and you know, who's just let their bad habits and bad mind states um, run rampant. So, and on the other hand, in regards to hell, what I meant to say is uh, a person in hell is not necessarily, or a person who's, who's, who's been through hell is not necessarily an evil person. In fact, going through hell, and we can talk about real hell in, in, as a realm, or we can talk about hell in the human realm, a person who's a human who goes through great suffering, often comes out of it quite a, a, a better person for it because they've been forced to observe themselves. They've been forced to see how they react to things. They've been forced to see the suffering of not getting what you want. Yeah. They've, they've oftentimes been forced to let go. And so Mahakala, coming out of hell, coming out of this terrible pain and suffering, 
appears to have learned quite a lot from it and uh, overcome his wickedness and real evil that he had cultivated. So there's two two aspects to this story in this verse. That, you know, the story is one one part, and the verse is another part. The story, of course, focuses much more on karma in terms of past life karma and that kind of thing. Uh, and the verse, but the verse itself doesn't necessarily deal with that. It's just talking about how evil 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 crushes you and that can that can be easily interpreted as being in this life and we often have this sort of disconnect where we wonder how you put these two pieces together you have on the one hand uh, the present present life where you do think you do bad things and clearly it affects you but then you have this other idea of how not only does it affect you but it somehow magically uh, creates similar situations in your next life. And there really doesn't need to be this sort of disconnect. When we talk about past life karma, we're really just talking about an extension of what's going on here and now. So what we can clearly see from our meditation, and this is really what we want to see, is how wretched evil is, how it crushes us. A lot of people have been complaining, I've been getting complaints about how they feel like them in the meditation they're just it's just making things worse right it's just drawing out all of your bad habits and when you say that when you say that it's it's you feel like it's making you a worse person right when you do this all of your worst characteristics come your worst qualities come out right it brings out the worst in you uh, but when you say that, what you're not re recognizing is that you're seeing quite clearly how, how wretched these are. Right? What's happening is you're, this is the process of, say, of, of realizing how awful evil is, how evil crushes you. That's what you're not, you're looking at it from the, different, from the other point of view in that, hey, meditation is making me evil. That's not really the case. Meditation is showing you how evil evil is. Right? Because as you practice and if you're, as you're objective, it just feels wretched, it feels awful. This is what leads people to stop meditating. Is they can't take it, it's uncomfortable. They don't want to see these things. Uh, but the way it feels to them is that meditation is just not good. Usually they're, they're, they're a li little bit more charitable and they say, I'm not good at meditation, I can't do it, I'm not capable. And, and that's the experience of seeing how wretched we are, how much wretchedness we have inside, how our evil is, is torturing us, is crushing us. And this is quite clear. This is what a meditator will see. Now the, the, the idea is that you see it again and again and again, and we're not familiar with this process, but this is the process of letting go. We wonder, how can I possibly let go? And we don't have any mechanism by which we should let go. This is the mechanism. See again and again how wretched evil is, how, how it crushes you, and eventually you'll let go. Uh, no, no question, complete guarantee. Be patient. And, and really important is to stop looking at it as me, as mine, as I, right? Because if you see it just as experiences, not as me, as mine, where's the problem? How could anything be a problem? A problem requires someone who has the problem, right? It has to be a problem for someone or some ones. If there's no one, and if it's not mine, right? Like these tornadoes, the hurricane. My mother's in Florida and Tampa, and Tampa just got trounced by a hurricane. And apparently it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be, but it's interesting to think, you know, only because my mother's there am I interested in the hurricane in Florida. And we get quite caught up and, and upset because we're worried about our family members, worried about ourselves, but when we hear about it in other places in the world, we might feel sad, but we're not, we're not in the same way upset by it. 
Uh, it's just to give you an example of, of this, how self creates suffering. So we're not talking about natural disasters, we're talking about our own experience in meditation. And if, you're, if you're able to see it uh, objectively, you free yourself from all that suffering that's caused by worrying about me and mine and my pain and my crazy mind. Because what can't you bear with if it's not yours? It's not happening to you. It's a trick, I think. You have to, you have to get over that hurdle of self. Get over yourself. So that's clear, but then the question is, well, hey, what, what the heck does that have to do with this idea of past lives and our fate and so on, and strange occurrences being related to similar occurrences in past lives? I mean, it's, it's very complicated. It's the kind of thing that you'd really have to, if you wanted to really understand it, you'd need to, you'd need to set up some kind of I mean, it, it, it's similar to quantum physics, I think, and I don't, I don't, I only mean it's similar in the sense that quantum physics is very complicated, and very hard to understand. It's not simply, oh, you kill someone in this life, you're going to be killed because it, there's some cosmic record. I mean, in a sort of a coarse sense, that's how it, that's true, but the cosmic record is really just the nature of reality. If you are, like take this man who, kill, who had this man killed, well what happened to his wife, right? It doesn't even say what happened to this man's wife. Assumedly, the soldier managed to find some way to, to, to take care of this woman as his wife and, and buy her or something as they bought and sold women back then. But how her life was changed. I mean, suppose her life was good before and then now she has to be a slave to this wicked soldier. Imagine this man's family, what happened to them. What I mean to say is that the fabric of reality changed because of this act. The world became a, a more evil place. You, you have this bucket of all the good and evil. One more evil marble was, uh, was dropped into the bucket. And so this sort of thing goes on all the time. Our experience of reality is very much dependent on our acts. It's interesting to think of in terms of climate change and so on, how our greed and our our, um, our community, commu communal greed and uh, con consumption, overconsumption is just destroying our own world. And so you can see this here and now, what's going on. You can see from generation to generation how we're polluting the world more and more and making it more and more hard to live for, for future generations. Uh, so the only thing that's different in Buddhism is that, well, we are those future generations generally. So uh, when we talk about how we corrupt the world, we're only corrupting our own world. And it's... If you have a sense of the idea of, of future lives, it's only, it's only right, or it's only understand. It's easy to understand how we should then become the ones to reap the, the fruit of our deeds, because this is what we know. This is our story. If you tell this story, uh, how you do all these good deeds or evil deeds, that's what's in your mind. That's how. That's the narrative and the way you look at the world. Why would you be born somewhere else if you're a soldier killing, having innocent men killed? Why would you somehow be born somewhere else? This is your world, this is your reality. You're caught up in this drama. And we're all caught up in drama. Why humans, humans are probably very often reborn as humans because we have a human drama. Of course, in this case, this man was had a, had a different kind of drama. His drama was corrupt and evil to the, you know, of a sort of hellish nature. And so as a result he went to hell. The, the results of our future lives is really just an extension of the karma of our present lives. There's nothing different about it. The evil that we have and makes who we are. 
we accept uh, the nature of our personality and so of course it has a huge impact on our future it's not that Buddhists believe in death it's, it's not that Buddhists believe in rebirth we just don't believe in death I often say this as you think about it, death is just a continuation nothing changes well, some things change but they're just details the details change the, the pattern remains the same and the patterns if you look at our habits that we start to see in meditation these habits definitely carry over these habits continue on the stream or continue the stream and the universe conspires around us and there are echoes of our deeds and echoes of our our, our mind states swarming around us and then of course there's the fact that uh, rebirth uh, allows for a powerful new beginning it's like a clean slate right rebirth we talk about it being a clean slate to some extent it is a clean slate the problem is we're full of muck and grime and that we bring to the slate all the all the muck and grime uh, that we carry around in our minds is imprinted is that much more powerful right a clean slate is all the more easy to get dirty it's not full of stuff and in fact so the results of deeds are often not felt in this life because the slate is not clean and because the slate has so much on it already the, the impact of our evil deeds or good deeds is far less when you're reborn it's that clean slate that, you, that, that really makes it powerful if you're a very good person the clean slate allows the creation of a wonderful fantastical life if your mind is full of evil, well, as the Buddha says, it crushes you. Just like a diamond crushes another gem. So the idea is that all the power that you, all the power in the world, all the power that there is, meaning all these beautiful gems, that's like our strength. Uh, some gems are very hard and, and strong, but none of them can, none of these powers can compare to karma. There's no worldly power, I suppose, besides wisdom, right? So the Buddha says, Dumeda, a fool, someone who is unwise. Evil crushes the fool. Evil doesn't crush a wise person. A wise person like Mahakala, in fact, wasn't crushed by the evil. He may have died, but he was a sotapanna. For sure he went to a good place. But the evil in the past had crushed him. He was a fool before. And so the evil that he had done crushed him. There you go. That's the Dhamma for tonight. The moral of the story. Evil crushes you. Strive on to overcome, to overcome the evil. You know, evil is really all that's important. When we talk about happiness and suffering. Happiness doesn't lead to happiness. You know, seek out happiness, it's not going to make you more happy. It only makes you more miserable in the end. If you seek out goodness, goodness makes you happy. And if you always focus your mind on goodness, not just good deeds, but goodness in the mind, clarity of mind, purity of mind, wisdom in the mind, good deeds can only come from that. Or good results can only come from that. That's what leads to happiness. And that's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in.